Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have Claire Headley, part two. Claire, welcome. Thank you very much. It's great to be back. Now, Claire, in our last episode, uh, your husband, Mark Headley, Mr. Blown for Good, had blown for good on January 4th, 2005. It's now January 24th, 2005. You're getting ready to escape from the Church of Scientology's notorious international base in Hemet, California. What happened? Yes. Well, Sunday, January 23rd, um, by that point, what I had in place is that I had managed to notify Mark by phone call that I was coming. Uh, we had agreed on the plan that I would go to my eye doctor's appointment at Walmart on Monday and that I would have called a cab and that he would, he was to, Mark was to call me at 10.15 a.m. on Monday morning on my organization phone and tell me what to do from there. And the idea was that by the time he called me, I would already be in the cab. Okay, so leading up to that, what I had to do is get a CSW approved to go to my eye doctor's appointment. So CSW is completed staff work. And anytime, when you're in the Sea Org, anytime you want to do anything other than the authorized schedule, you are required to have written authorization of exactly what you want to do and why, and that needs to be approved. So in this case, I was I wanted to go to an eye doctor's appointment, so I had to have written authorization. I had to be signed off on by five people who were all senior to me, as well as the ethics officer, to say that I was authorized to leave the property, go to the eye doctor in, uh, in Hemet at Walmart, and then return to the property. So on Sunday, I started preparing my CSW, my completed staff work, saying that I had this appointment scheduled. And my whole plan had been premised on the fact that the, the system that was in place at the property was the medical officer would pile four or five staff members into her car and she would drive them into town, into Hemet, drop them at their respective appointments, and then they would each go to their appointments, and then she would make another round and pick them all back up again. On that format and on that assumption, I would have approximately one to two hours of a head start in my escape process, and I kind of had premised that that would be what I would need in order to make sure I was successful. Well, as it happened, on Sunday night, I was called in by the ethics officer, who told me, oh, well, um, you can go to your appointment. However, your the medical officer is not going to take you. You're going to go with a dedicated escort who's, you know, I mean, the, what that meant to me as a translation was you're going to be specifically under watch. You're going to have a buddy who's going to drive you there, sit with you during your appointment, and then drive you back to make damn sure you don't escape. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what was in place. So as I'm sitting there in the office, of course, with the ethics officer telling me this, I have instantly running through my head, oh my, my plan is going to hell in a handbasket and before I've even gotten off the property. Um, and now I'm going to have to figure out how to ditch an escort uh, and I've lost any kind of ability to have any kind of head start because my, my, as soon as I've started on my escape, they're going to know that I'm... I'm making a break for it. And, and but what could I say if I, I knew that if I threw up a protest or questioned this in any way, they wouldn't let me go and they would know I was going to try and blow. So I just accepted it. And then what did you do? How, how do you work around having a guard on you? Yes. So so the next um, the next thing that happened was that night I, I went to went to sleep. Uh, Sue Wilhair tried to come and have a conversation with me saying that I was not looking so great. I, I, I told her, no, I'm already, already sleeping. Um, anyway, the next, so the next morning I got up very, very early. And again, I took a risk here too, in that I, I made a call on my organization phone, which they would have the access to the records. Um, and I called a cab company and I, I told them, yes, I need to order a cab from Walmart at 1015. And my name is Barbara Smith. And I'm going I'm going from Walmart to the Riverside bus station. And the lady said, OK, she took that all down. And I asked her, so 
so how much is that fare going to be? And she said, that will be $90. And I'm going, wow. Oh my, I had $200 by this point saved up <laughs> $200 Jeez. to my name and $90 of it. And I'm not even going to make it out of Riverside County. This is what, what the situation was. Anyway, I had a, a down jacket that I w was going to wear to my appointment. I, and I had stuffed a few meager belongings into the pockets, whatever would fit there. And then uh, come 930, I, I went up. And so my assigned escort, her name was Christy Mullins. And she said, OK, let's go. So we get in the car, driving, drive to Walmart in Hemet. As we pull into Walmart, now I'm I'm faced with the problem of how am I going to ditch this woman? Um, and as we're pulling into the parking lot, just, you know, any Walmart has two entrance exit points. And we happen to be on one side. I look over to the other entrance and there's my yellow cab sitting right there. I'm like, oh my gosh. At, wow. And as it happened, she couldn't immediately see a parking spot. So I said, hey, Christy, you know what? It's 1015. I mean, literally it was 1015 on the dot. Say, so Christy, let me out up front. I'll go into my appointment because it's right now. So I don't miss it while you find a parking spot. Okay. She went for it. I'm like screaming hallelujahs in, in my head going, <laughs> I'm not going to have to outrun her at least. Um, so she lets me out. I walk in. There's a part of me that is just knowing that PIs are going to be coming after me and all of the drama associated with with making this escape i i walked as fast as i could i didn't run because i didn't want to attract any attention or anything else i walked as fast as i could through the walmart walked out and got into the cab and the cab driver looks over at me and he says barbara smith i'm like yep that's <laughs> me <laughs> riverside bus station prompt two please okay so he starts driving off before literally before he is we've even made it off the, out of the walmart parking lot christy buzzes me on the radio and she says uh where are you I'm like oh i'm in the bathroom i'll be right there um meanwhile i'm thinking to myself boy oh boy this this cab driver knows that barbara smith is certifiably crazy <laughs> anyway so because I, I couldn't turn my phone off yet because I was waiting for Mark's call and I'm praying that Mark is going to call me before Christy buzzes me back to tell me I'm not in the bathroom. Um, sure. Anyway, so sure enough, probably a couple of minutes goes by and Mark calls. I'm like, <sighs> so, so he says, okay, where are you? I'm like, okay, I'm in the cab. And he's like, oh my gosh. So he tells me, okay, when you get to the Riverside bus station, here's what you're going to do. You're going to um, turn your phone back on and call a company in New York. And he gave me the number and it was an audio visual company. And he says, and you're gonna ask them, just say this exactly, don't say anything else. Just say, please give me directions of how to get to your company from Times Square. So I'm like, okay. And honestly, I've never been to New York. All of this was practically foreign language to me, but whatever, I, sure. I wrote, wrote it down in my notes. And he's like, and as soon as that's done, Mark says, Turn off your phone, and no matter what happens, under no circumstances, do not turn your phone back on. Because he and I both were very well aware that they use the phones to track you down when you escape. They Sure, yeah. yeah. And then he tells me, okay, and then when you get to the bus station, buy a ticket to Barstow, uh, which will be $20. So I would still, so I'm $90 into my $200 budget. So that would be $20. So I'd have $90 left. And then when you get to Barstow, call me on a, on a pay phone and I'll tell you what to do from there. So I'm like, okay, okay, good. So I hung up with Mark. We do the cab drive to the Riverside bus station. That all goes fine. <clears throat> and I had turned off my phone. So obviously I didn't get any more phone calls from Christy. Um, I get to the Riverside bus station and... Well, well, Claire, let me interject. How long is the drive from uh, the Walmart to the Riverside bus station? It was about 40 minutes. So it's a... Now, you're at the Walmart on Sanderson and Hemet? Yes. And if uh, just for readers who are following this, who want to follow on Google Maps, you can see... You can actually map Claire's drive, which I've done. So you've got about 40 minutes and your phone's turned off. Yes. Now, by this time, has your your escort, Christy Mullins, called the base and said she's gone? Yes, absolutely. So, the, so they know that you've blown. Yes. And 
things are going into effect. So what happens when you hit Riverside bus station? OK, so I get to Riverside bus station. I um, I turn back on my phone and I call this company in New York and I say, yes, hi, can you give me directions of how to get to, to your company from Times Square? And they're like, well, look on Google. <laughs> I'm like, uh, OK, thank you. <laughs> And I and I hang up and I turned off my phone. I'm like, okay, I did that. <laughs> and then and then I went into the bathroom there and I took off my Sea Org uniform pants and my belt and I dumped it in the trash there and I switched into normal pants. Uh, and then I went to the counter and I bought my ticket. And again, I said, yeah, I'm Barbara Smith and I I need a ticket to Barstow. So I paid the $20 for the ticket from Riverside bus station to Barstow. And that was going to be arriving into Barstow at around 1.30, as I recall, 1, 1.30. And Mark had told me that there was going to be a small window. So I was going to have to call him right away as soon as I arrived to Barstow. So meanwhile, I wait for the bus. And of course, I'm the whole time looking out the windows, waiting for security and PIs to show up. But nonetheless, I just bided my time and got on the bus to Barstow. And so, so far, so good. Um, the first bump, well, you know, the next bump, I guess I should say, that I ran into was when the bus arrived at Barstow, there were no pay phones that accepted coins. Again, being that, I, you know, I am absolutely, I know that PIs are going to be coming. So I don't want to call attention to myself. So I think, well, the last thing I want to do is be the, the you know, idiotic adult, 30-year-old that has no idea what a calling card is. So I panicked and, um, and I turned back on my phone and called Mark. <laughs> because, you know, of course I didn't, I, that was seemed to be, well, it was, it's what I did in my, in yeah, my well, moment yeah, of panic. Else? What else am I going to do? I need, I knew I had to talk to Mark. And of course the first thing Mark says is he freaks out and says, what are you calling me from this phone for? Be that as it may, what's done was done. Um, he said, look, you know, here's your ticket number for your ticket. You're going to be getting on a bus that's leaving there at 145 and it's coming to Kansas City and I'll meet you. Uh, I'll be there when you get there. So I said, okay, I knew it was Kansas City. I'm thinking to myself, and but you know, anyway, so now I had the ticket. And of course, when I went to the counter to give them my reference number that Mark had given, they had calling cards right there. I'm like, oh, oh so I bought oh a no. calling card and at least knew that I didn't have to turn on the phone ever again. Um, anyway, so I get on the bus from leaving from Barstow. The bus was going through Vegas. And in Vegas, I was going to change bus and I had a 45 minute layover. And keep in mind, too, you know, I hadn't I'd had very, very little sleep. I hadn't eaten. I had two protein bars in my purse. Um, but other than that, I hadn't eaten a meal in days. Um, so I thought to myself, OK, well, if all's going well, when I get to Vegas, I'll get a good meal and then I'm sure I'll feel much better. So, you know, I get on the bus to Vegas again. It's seemingly uneventful. Everything's going as planned. We pull into Vegas. It's dark. It was probably around six or seven o'clock at night. So I thought, well, I'll just wait for everybody else to get off the bus first and then I'll I'll get off the bus and go see, you know, go see if I can get something cheap at McDonald's or whatever. Get off the bus. I haven't even made it into the, the Greyhound terminal. I just have my hand, I've opened the door and boom, Greg Wilhair is right in front of me. Oh, jeez. <laughs> like he, so it became obvious to me. It wasn't that he was looking for me. He knew the bus that I was on. He knew, I mean, he was right there in front of me. It wasn't like, you know, now for our listeners who don't know, please tell us who Greg Wilhair is, yes. his post. Yeah. yeah, so Greg Wilhair, he's essentially one of the top David Miscavige goonies. He's had various different post titles over the years and various different positions, but he was the IG for many years before Marty was. He's been number two, number three guy on and off for years. Uh, he was on the ship in the early days. He is definitely one of... David Miscavige's entourage execution people. He was also, he and Marty were famous for 
kind of being the the go-to guys to recover escapees. Okay, so just like Marty recovered Annie Tidman. Yes. Getting on a plane. Now, Greg Wilhair, who's senior RTC official, is there in Vegas wanting to get you back. Yes. And Sharon Johnston was also there, who had been my senior. So there were at least two people in that bus station. I, I'm positive that there were other people there as well that I didn't see. Instantly, I my heart sank. I'm like, oh my gosh, they've caught me. He says, you're not doing this. You're not leaving. We're You're going to come back with us. And I'm going, oh, my God. So I thought, okay, you know, it's one of those moments where you you have to kind of instantly figure out what the hell you're going to do. So the best plan I could come up with was I just walked through the door and I walked into the center of the terminal. And in my mind, I was just praying and hoping that if he if he tried to drag me out of there, somebody would see and call 911. And if I had to scream, I could scream. But you know, I thought, well, at least if I stay in, in in here. And of course, Greg is like, oh, come eat dinner with us. Let's talk this over. <laughs> and, you know, that can seem like a simple statement. In my starved frame of mind at that moment, the hardest possible thing to do was say, nope, I'm not doing it. And, and as I sat there, well, I stood there in the bus station. I ended up sitting down on my purse um, in the middle of the bus station, just going, okay, I kind of evaluated my situation and thought, well, I have 30 minutes before the next bus leaves. It, I, if I can just somehow, some way, get on the next bus and keep going, then I, I will have a hope in hell of ever seeing Mark again. Meanwhile, Greg, Greg is grilling me saying, oh, I need Mark's phone number. I'm like, you have it. Security's already called him. Ask security. <laughs> and um, sure enough, he gets... He gets uh, Mark's phone number from security and calls Mark and tells Mark, oh, we've got her. She's not coming. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh. What do you do? You're, you're, you're in Las Vegas, in the middle of Greyhound, and they're not going to go away. No. And you just have to tough it out until the bus comes to, to get you to Kansas City. Yes. And, and Greg Wilhair tried everything. I mean, he, he literally said to me, he's like, Claire, look around you. Is this what you want to live in? And I'm thinking to myself, well, no, this is the bus station. Like, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no. And, and Greg said to me, well, what if David Miscavige was right here in front of you right now? And I, I didn't even answer that. I'm like, well, it's a good thing he ain't here because... Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had nothing, nothing good to say. Him. Yeah. Did, no. Nothing good to say to that man. Now, does the bus show up? Yes. And it's... and of course, in the interim, Greg, you know, um, told me my family was never going to be able to move up the bridge anymore. My, you know, he threw everything at me. And I just, I, in my mind, I just thought, well, I'm just going to plug my ears and I'm going to just stick it through because I've, I've, I've given to this course of action. I know it's the right thing to do somehow, some way, even though I've been intercepted, I'm gonna have to make it happen. So all of my make it go right training kicked in real good there. And uh, <laughs> and so I got on, so I made it on the bus. He threatened to follow me on the bus, and he, which he didn't because he had no ticket. Um, and anyway, I, I kind of knew that he would have to have special approval from Miscavige to, to do that. and. Anyway, he didn't follow me on the bus. The second I got on the bus, of course, by that point, I, I was like, well, they know where I am now. So no worry about using my organization phone. So I turned on my phone and I called Mark and I said, Mark, I'm on the bus. He's like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, he asked me what happened. And, and I told him he's like, they told me they caught you. I'm like, well, they did technically, but. Yeah, you know, I'm still on the bus anyway. Claire, I'm glad you said that because that the point is the uh, Church of Scientology is not the police. Even though they like to act like the police, like they can take people into custody and all that. At the end of the day, any Sea Org member listening should know they are not the police. You have your rights. You can do whatever you damn well please. Yes. And it, because at a certain point it becomes a kidnapping false imprisonment and that stuff they can go to jail for that's right i mean they have and they have done that they did that with mark yeager when he was escaping they hauled him into a minivan and i i was well aware that they have done that so well t t times have changed and uh they can't do this no no so 
So you're on the bus. How long of a ride is it to Kansas City? It was uh, basically two days. That's a long bus trip. <laughs> yes. And and you don't have that much money, but you you you've got maybe seventy dollars at this point, something like that. Yes. So you have enough money to get to Kansas City. Yes. And so I called Mark using my calling card. Then, um, with at every every stop thereafter, I called him, and 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 it was uneventful. There were no other no other bumps in the road and I made it successfully on Wednesday evening, which was um, two days after. When you're on the two day bus ride, what are you thinking about? We have plenty of time to think and you know you're out of the organization forever. What are your thoughts on that long bus ride? Yeah, um, I would say, well, you know, I thought about it a lot and what really struck me in retrospect about it is the absolute pure exhilaration of being free and knowing that I was going to be free to make a, make my life with Mark and be reunited with Mark and everything else. There was absolutely, you know, I've compared it, you, generally speaking, in the real world, you know, yes, people go through life changes and there's excitement, but there's also, oh, maybe they're going to miss some people. You know, there's some regrets or sadnesses about moving on and different chapters in your life. There was not one single regret that I had. I knew absolutely I'd made the right decision and I was absolutely exhilarated. Now that's a tremendous story. So, And it's one that gets repeated, the exhilaration of getting the hell out of that insanity. Yes. And for listeners, I, I Google mapped it from uh, Greyhound Las Vegas to Greyhound Kansas City uh, 1,349 miles. Yes. It's literally halfway across the country. It is 19 hours, 24 minutes without traffic. Yes. But that exhilaration you're feeling over those two days. So you pull into the Greyhound, Kansas City, Mark's there waiting for yes. you. What happens then? Yes. <laughs> I was like, oh, I made it. Um, you know, we, of course we hugged and it was extremely <laughs> emotional reu reunion. And Mark told me that he was staying with his dad at that time. So we drove back that night and <laughs> over the next, you know, the next few days, I kind of adjusted and within two or three days, I had a job at, at a local pizza restaurant. Uh, it was the first job I applied for. <laughs> and so to go from being in the hole at the end base to being a, a, a waitress at a pizza restaurant was absolutely therapeutic beyond belief. I can't even begin to tell you. I can imagine it. You know, you go from working for David Miscavige in the Religious Technology Center to serving pizza. Yes. And people, you know, realize that humble kind of honest work is so much better than life at the top of a big religious cult. Yes, I had. Yeah, no, absolutely. I was, I was very grateful. You know, I, like, like I touched on earlier, you know, one of my biggest fears was, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Like, how do I get a job? What do I put on my resume? Oh, yeah, hi, I'm Claire. I worked in a cult for 15 years. I mean, the, you know, the the complete seemingly gargantuan hurdles of the adjustment process to adjusting to a life in the real world and earning a wage and making money and, you know, finding a place to live and all of that stuff. Those were all extremely enjoyable problems to have, I would say, as a coming out of all that. I was very grateful for every small little problem that I had to tackle because by comparison, there was there was no comparison to the circumstances of life at the end base. That's well said. And, and you and Mark, you really have a story. You and Mark have a story of love triumphing over evil. Yes. So you rebuild your lives now, but that's not the end of it. Because the Church of Scientology, although you're done with it, they're not done with you by a long shot. No, not, a, not even close. Well, first of all, just uh, uh, so on the immediate, to cover the immediate few months after we left, the very first thing was that I... I had an email address for my mother and I wanted her to know that I was okay. So I sent her an email and I said, you know, mom, I love you. I just want you to know, um, I'm sorry for whatever you're going to go through, but I needed you to know that I'm okay. And so actually within a week, um, of leaving, I had a few emails back and forth with my mother and in there, she very clearly told me, you know, 
she told me that she'd been called in to pack the next day after I'd blown and given my declare order and that she was completely devastated. Um, and she said that she was, you know, she knew that I had cho chosen Mark over staying with the organization and she felt that she'd made that same choice back when she had been in the Sea Org, uh, you know. Um, so she understood that choice. Um, and she made several references to the fact that she knew her email was being watched by OSA and and she could she would have to disconnect from me. But she wanted me to know that she loved me and um, she, you know, obviously wanted me to do what I had to do to get back in good standing. Well, that was her intent anyway. <clears throat> and by that point, I, I did not have my our, our freeloader bills. So I, I called OSA and I said, well, I want to talk to Kirsten Catano. And they were like, well, you know, we'll take a message. And I, I also sent Kirsten an email and said, OK, well, here we are in Kansas City. So what do I need to do to get back in good standing? Because I did not want to lose my family. And I didn't hear back from Kirsten, but I did get an email from Greg Wilhair. And he said, oh, your declare is on hold. You need to come back and route out. Now that's done all the time, right? Come back and route out. Yes. So what that means is the state, the stated policy is that there is a leaving staff routing form. And for any staff member that says, hey, I want to leave, then they're put on this routing form. In truth, really what that routing form is, a series of steps that are fully intended to uncover whatever quote unquote crimes the staff member has committed that are causing quote unquote, him or her to want to leave and the routing form will be completed with the end result that the person no longer wants to leave. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's called a leaving staff routing form, but really it would be better stated as a preventing staff from leaving routing form. Now, Claire, that's uh, interesting you'd say that because the same thing applies to the refund cycle. If a, a public member wants a refund of money, the routing form to get a refund or the whatever you call it. Yes. These things should really, by the church, if it were honest, should be called get the person to change their mind so they don't leave the sea or get the person to change their mind so they don't ask for a refund. That's exactly right. Yep. And it's it's all about manipulation and pressure. Get them back under our control. Yes. And if they do want a refund or they want to leave, strip them all their, of all their legal rights and gag them into silence. Yes. And this is uh, why uh, in the Luis Garcia lawsuit, the term contracts of adhesion are mentioned, one-sided contracts. What was your response to the re request to come back and route out? Well, realize that I, I mean, by this point, I had barely been gone for a week. So I was still very much in the frame of mind of, the I was very much oriented to trying to do what they asked me to do, even at that point. Mark broke out of that mold much easier than I did. And I honestly think that has to do with the fact that I was in the cadet org for so many years and in it much deeper from a much earlier age. And also, too, I was higher up the bridge, which I think worked to against me. But with that said, so I answered back and I thought, well, you know, by this point, we were, let's see, a week to three weeks out as this conversation was transpiring. And by this, by three weeks out, we had signed a lease on an apartment. We had an apartment in Kansas City, as two bedrooms. We, Mark was doing computer repair work and I had a, the, my job as a, wait, a waitress at the pizza restaurant and I was starting to do office work for an insurance company that wanted to hire me full time. Um, so things were moving along very well in terms of establishing our lives. And so, but nonetheless, I, you know, they had the carrot on me that they were like, well, if you don't get declared, then I would be able to finally have a relationship with my family. And I really wanted that. My, you know, my sister, my younger sister, Kirsten, had just been absolutely devastated by the news of my declare. And, you know, she was really, really upset, which hurt me to the core. Sure, and this is where the church pits, pit, you know, basically is using emotional blackmail on you. Yes, definitely. And so I, you know, I talked to Mark. I'm like, well, maybe we could figure it out to go back and do a sec check. And, and of course, Mark was like, I'm not staying in pack. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't see Mark doing a sack check. No, <laughs> no. But, but you know, at the same token, he was supportive. He's like, well, if that's what you want to do, then find out the details. How long are you going to need to be there? Blah blah blah. So I, I answered Greg Wilhair back, and I said, okay, well, tell me what's needed exactly. I never heard back from him. And the reason I never heard back from him is because he ended up being put on the deck. So I learned that from Tom DeVocht and, and a couple of other people <laughs> that he was on, on the decks at birthing uh, at the base. So I never heard back from, from uh, Greg. That was in January. Fast forward to now it's the, towards, I think, the end of February. And out of the blue, I get a phone call from Warren McShane. He's the legal guy in RTC. Warren McShane, who I, you know, often had to do sex checks for, for his propensity to look at porn on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and also for his, the other propensity was lying to David Miscavige. Anyway, Warren calls me. He says, hey, Claire, it's Warren. So listen, you have to come back and do the RPF. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, you have got to be freaking kidding me. Seriously, like now I've been blown for two months. I'm like finally starting to decompress. Like the process is beginning. Like we talked about earlier, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sleeping, I'm eating, I'm enjoying working. Mark and I have watched like 200 movies by now. <laughs> so you've got, you caught up on all those years that you were in the church. Yes. Oh, we you had a, we, we signed up for Netflix and we were burning through Movies like, you know, we, we often refer to the years that we were in, you know, the 15 years that we were at the end base as our media blackout years. We, we are missing many reference points that people in the real world are very shocked about. Like, they're like, oh, my gosh, you've never seen Friends? Like, no, nope, never saw Friends. Oh, my gosh, you never saw the Oprah Winfrey show? Nope, never saw it. So you and Mark are burning through Netflix. You're just getting back in the mainstream culture, feeling you own your lives again. Yes. And then they call you and say, well, Claire, you've got to come back and do RPF. Yes. <laughs> and, you, and, and I just, I mean, I was shocked. I was like, oh my gosh. I mean, talk about seven degrees of separation. It was just, there was nothing more outrageous that Warren could have said to me. And I just was like, okay, well, I'm not doing that. He was like, okay, that's your choice. I'm like, yep, that's my choice. He said, okay, well then we'll send you your declare. I'm like, okay, good. And so because I had been in RTC, I knew that they had had some serious legal issues by not giving escaped staff their belongings. So I thought, well, now's the time, Warren, I would like my belongings back. So he said, okay, well, we'll start packing them up and you can figure out um, the details. I'm like, okay, well, Mark, how about Mark and I come to sublet and pack up our stuff? And Warren was like, no way, not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, okay, <laughs> go ahead then, pack it up for me. And he said, no, you can arrange a truck and we'll, we'll pack up the truck. We'll, we'll arrange a trade-off. Um, this is so, this is so mean spirited. It's sort of like Claire, go to hell. You figure out how to get your stuff but you can have it back, but we won't help. Yes. So, so we agreed on Warren and I in this, in this phone call. And then we had a few emails subsequently agreed on the plan that Mark and I would rent a, a Penske truck. They would load it up and we would arrange a trade off and we would get all of our belongings back as well as our dog who we had had to leave behind. But so that was the plan. And that's what ended up happening with you know, some, of course, every step along the way, there are outrageous stories that go along with it, but that, that concluded my, um, my relationship with my family since I was firmly declared at that point. Well, Claire, thank you for sharing this. I'd like to do part three where, you know, you have your stuff and, and then Mark begins, you know, wanting his sister out of the base. Yes. They won't let her go. So he starts posting online. Why don't we do part three that's called Mr. and Mrs. Blown for Good. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you so much for surviving Scientology Radio. This is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you for listening. As always, we'll be in very good touch.